Um, so folks, we're going to have just a slight adjustment to our agenda. Up next was scheduled a 10 minute break followed by our socioeconomics technical session. However, our lunch was delivered early and rather than torture all of you of having a 10 minute break and seeing the food but not being able to eat it yet, um, we're gonna propose that we do our socioeconomics technical session now, it's three lightning talks, and then we'll transition to lunch straight from there. So if the socioeconomics group can head up this way, our moderator Ellen can come up and introduce it and I'll get us reconnected here. All right, hi everyone. I'm Ellen Bruno. I'm a cooperative extension specialist and water resource economist at UC Berkeley. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating our socioeconomics uh, session, the last session holding you all uh, before lunch, uh, but it's a short one. We have uh, three great speakers uh, today, each have five minutes, and then we'll have five minutes of questions afterwards, so hold your questions to the end. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the three of them and then we'll just go one after another. So um, first we have uh, Dr. Tyler Scott, who is an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis, gonna talk to us about groundwater governance. Um, and then we'll hear from Jeff Hadachek, uh, soon to be Dr. Jeff Hadachek. He is a PhD student in the Ag and Resource Economics Department at UC Davis and, and graduating this academic year. Um, talking about uh, uh, water quality and rural, water access in rural communities. And then lastly, we'll hear from uh, Professor David Zilberman, uh, my colleague at, at UC Berkeley in the Department of Ag and Resource Economics about water use and land use uh, in California. So thank you so much. And um, Tyler, you're, you're up if you're ready. Hello, everybody. Uh, so it's social science time, which is, I know, the segment you've all been waiting for. Um, so I'm on the uh, groundwater governance team. So I'm here on behalf of Dr. Mark Lubell and our uh, amazing GSR, Elise Zufall. Um, why governance? Uh, why are we, we talking about people and complication when uh, we have all these awesome models and remote sensing and we can uh, do all this cool technical stuff? Uh, fundamentally, right, we have this problem with groundwater governance and just about any other problem we care about where there's tons of people involved and nobody's really in charge. So even if you have a really great model, even if you have some really great technology, uh, you still have to get everyone on the same page in terms of making that decision and actually following through and implementing. Uh, groundwater reform in the state of California and elsewhere is a really great example for those of us who care about complex governance structures because we have this hierarchical structure where there's some top-down decision making, some bottom-up flow as well, this decentralized structure where we put forth some rules at a high level and then people in local communities get to figure out how they actually make these choices and how they sort of customize their approach to fit within those high-level regulations uh, that are appropriate for their local community. And then uh, what I think makes it particularly interesting, and this is always a little bit of a controversial thing to say in a room full of uh, scientists, is that technical problems don't really resolve political disputes. Uh, and so just being mindful that no matter how good our science gets, some of these core value-based disputes are still gonna be there. And we can't simply model our way out of that. And so thinking about how we can design and, and build better structures, create better processes that help people use science more effectively to make decisions and to navigate those political disputes rather than assume them away. So what are we doing for our sub-team? Uh, what is our sub-team up to for this project? What we spent the last year doing is collecting all of the groundwater management plans we can access in the state of California, uh, converting those into machine readable text and starting to build a queryable database that we're going to use for subsequent analysis. Uh, Sigma has kind of a unique feature that's helping us along the way here. Each uh, GSA that is publishing a plan also publishes an index, uh, like a spreadsheet, where they say, here's where we talk about these different things. Because one of the challenges when you start to ask questions like, well, what's in this plan, is you have a you know, thousand page PDF and you have to find bits of content within it. And so we're able to uh, build code that takes these uh, like bibliographies or indexes that they publish and then tell the computer, hey, go grab this bit of information here, grab this bit here. Long term, what we're hoping to do with that is be able to train a model so that even if we're working with groundwater plans in Arizona or somewhere else where they're not required to publish the same sort of like bibliography or spreadsheet, we can detect that automatically and pull that out. 
What we've done so far, and I'm going to mention this briefly, and then I'd encourage you to come to the poster session where Elise is going to present on this in more detail, is start to do some uh, automated content analysis on these plans and understand how do the characteristics of who's involved and what each basin is dealing with in terms of their problems shape the different things that they address more or less in each plan. Some of those findings are somewhat intuitive, uh, so you might not be surprised, for instance, that basins where there's a higher rate of agricultural groundwater reliance tend to focus more on quantity issues rather than, uh, rather than quality issues in their plans. Some things are less intuitive. We don't, for instance, see any correspondence between the presence of, of more people living in disadvantaged communities and any increased focus on vulnerable populations in plants. And so there isn't some sort of response function where if you have more vulnerable people, that's a more significant component of your planning. Where we're going for year two and beyond. Uh, we're taking this and we're hoping to, well, not hoping to, we are going to uh, build uh, a set of automated tools for extracting out who's involved in these different planning processes and how they fit together. So taking, uh, oh, this didn't go forward. There we go, went forward on my end, sorry. Uh, so using natural language processing tools to identify the different relationships between people, organizations, data, and strategies that are embodied in these plans and developing a network representation of what's going on in each basin and then how those different basins are connected. Uh, so we're going to use that to be able to ultimately speak to how these different structures, how who's involved, how they're connected, what information they're using, those sorts of details ultimately shape the strategies they adopt uh, and, and shape how they go about implementing those processes as we track that over time. We're also uh, going to turn this into a generalizable model that again allows us to apply this to future plans that are published and to other regions and other states where they're publishing plans as well. So building out some California domain specificity and then turning it into something that we can generalize to monitor going forward. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Ellen mentioned, my name is Jeff Hadichek, and I'm a PhD student here at Davis. And the project that I'll briefly talk about today is co-authored with Ellen and uh, Nick Haggerty, who is at Montana State, and then Katrina Gesso, who is also here at Davis but is teaching a class right now. Um, and so I'm going to motivate this by talking about surface water to start off with. Um, and I probably don't need to tell most people in this audience, but um, drought in California manifests itself through surface water reductions um, throughout the growing season. And so um, through, through the state's network of surface water canals, the state, the state water project, the Central Valley Project, or the Lower Colorado River Project. And so what we see is that in years where there is drought, like 1994 and 2015, um, these areas in, in the Central Valley in particular receive a percentage of their allocation as opposed to the full amount of their entitlement. Um, where in wetter years like 2006, um, everybody in the Central Valley receives their, their full entitlement of, of surface water. And so um, what we see then is that there is this close relationship between surface water availability and groundwater um, depletion and groundwater use. And so the left axis here map in the yellow line map um, the percentage of state water project allocations um, in a given year. And then the blue line maps changes in groundwater levels across monitoring wells in the state of California. So we see, again, like in years like 2006, groundwater actually recharges on a year-to-year -year change basis. However, then in, in drought years or continued drought years like 2014, 2015, and then even more recently, um, 2019, 2020, um, groundwater is declining as much up to six feet on average across groundwater monitoring wells. And so um, what our project uh, attempts to do is to quantify this relationship uh, both between heat and surface water availability on three um, groundwater outcomes. First is that outcome of year-to-year -year changes in groundwater um, changes in groundwater levels. Um, second is the likelihood that these private wells um, fail, and specifically where there's this tension between agricultural groundwater use and then residential groundwater use for domestic purposes for households that are not connected to public water systems. And then lastly, to look at sort of the mechanisms as, as to whether this is a, a purely physical relationship between evapotranspiration and, and surface water um, availability to recharge, uh, in addition to additional groundwater pumping by farmers themselves, 
we see how uh, groundwater um, wells, agricultural groundwater wells, um, the number of constructed agricultural groundwater wells change in these years where there is uh, additional heat and surface water scarcity. And so just briefly to overview um, the findings, um, we see that a one acre foot per crop acre reduction in surface water availability causes groundwater levels to decrease by 3.7 um, feet on average across monitoring wells within those areas that receive those reductions. Um, second, if you're, if you're a household that is located within um, those areas that receive reductions and you rely on private domestic wells for groundwater purposes, this one acre foot reduction per crop acre increases the probability that your domestic well will fail by, by 5%. Um, and then lastly, um, that farmers annually in, in the state of California as a whole spend approximately $37 million um, in constructing new groundwater wells. And, and this shows that uh, farmers uh, use as an as a, um, adaptation strategy to drought and additional heat, um, it becoming more groundwater dependent. And so uh, I, I don't mention this here briefly as well, but we also look at how uh, harmful degree days, um, heating degree days um, in agriculture as well, surface water held constant, how that impacts these three outcomes as well. And we see a, a very similar relationship across all three, three outcomes. So that is to say is that as we look forward and, and uh, if we expect um, drought to become more variable or precipitation to become more variable um, and um, heat to become uh, increasing as well with climate change, um, these are all outcomes that will bear burdens um, of climate change adaptation um, and mitigation strategies through groundwater dependence. So thank you and I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Zilperman. My name is David Zilberman. Uh, I'll speak about uh, the two activities that we did. Uh, the first one, uh, we analyzed data that, uh, of a survey on uh, the use of uh, CMS. Uh, you know what CMS is, it's California Irrigation Management Information System. And uh, it, uh, it's a study took about four or five years, and uh, we got the result on the last year, so we use it as part of this report. And uh, we got uh, several thousand, resp uh, two thousand uh, responses. Uh, about quarter are farmers, but we got them um, uh, from farmer, consultant, uh, different type of users of CMS. And the question that we wanted to know is what is the value of CMS uh, to agriculture? And, uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, the, the, we have a diverse uh, users. Uh, we can find that for uh, most of them, uh, the especially water district CMS is extremely uh, important device because they use it to allocate, uh, to manage water, to allocate water among uh, uh, farmers, uh, and also it has a lot of other activities. For example, uh, managing uh, p uh, pest control, they manage it for research. Then uh, we try to assess the water saving in agriculture associated with CMS. And generally speaking, it's around 20%. Almost everyone got the, say, uh, the, same estimate, uh, the same estimate. And we try to look at what is a, a benefit from it. Uh, several years before we did it, and uh, we can found that the benefit uh, can be uh, something, uh, uh, in agriculture can be about it, uh, up to $287 million in a drought. Then we try to assess what is the extra value of CMS uh, altogether uh, for agriculture, and this is, a, uh, and, and it's incredible. You, you gain a large amount of uh, water use, the f uh, water saving, the, since you can, are able to save water, we have a constraint on overall water use in California, you can increase the acre, so, so you basically gain more water from, uh, if, uh, more yield from the water that uh, you save. You have a uh, yield effect and quality effects of the benefit altogether is about $400 million. Now, our survey is much bigger and what we find in the survey that the gain from CMS to the urban water user is bigger because they pay much more for water. So a program like CMS generate something like close to a billion dollar in benefit. Since the, since, the, since the cost of CMS is, I don't know, is about uh, $10 million, 
you can realize that big investment in uh, public re uh, research are very benef uh, beneficial. Now, I did several studies on the uh, benefit of research in agriculture, and what I found is a lot of research uh, products generate no value. But uh, we assess the benefit from drip irrigation that California put maybe 100 million a year in research, and the benefits are much bigger than a billion. And something like CMS, even if you don't believe it's a billion, it's several hundred million. So this type of product that are run mostly by extension are extremely valuable. Now, the, se the, se the second uh, uh, study that I do, and I only mentioned, is a deeper study on the supply chain of uh, water in California agriculture and, and how it is changed. And the main message is that California agriculture is extremely adaptive to uh, water changes. Uh, the drought in 1976, uh, 77, even though they were not as severe as the current drought, had much more impact on real life than some of the re uh, recent dry, uh, drought. And as long as we continue to invest uh, uh, in research and have program like this, and farmers respond, I think it will be okay. I worry about other areas of California, but as long as we have this support, it's great. And uh, Sigma is one of the incredible capacity of the supply chain and the system in California to adapt to drought. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, we have a, a few minutes uh, for questions. Um, I'll go ahead and kick us off with a with a question for Tyler. Um, <laughs> so uh, I like that your your framing of sort of how you know if we have more and better information that doesn't necessarily lead to to better decisions all the time because there's all this other fun stuff going on. And so uh, with your project on looking at how uh, groundwater uh, governance structure affects outcomes, um, how do you sort of anticipate your results uh, contributing to better decision making? That's a great question, right? Because it's one thing to describe what's going on and another to say, what do you do? Um, so the way I think about that is someone or a group of people, right, had to design like the institutional structure of Sigma. And so they had some idea of like, we need to get people working together on this. Here's how we should arrange it. Here's what will enable effective decision making. We'll provide them with this type of scientific input. We'll put these requirements in place. So being able to speak to how effective that institutional arrangement is so that the next time someone needs to design a similar program or they need to update Sigma and say, hey, we're like doing round two of how we're implementing this policy, they can alter that structure in some way or say, hey, actually, we need to build connections between basins in this way or involve this person at the start or create some different accountability mechanism on the back end, those sorts of like institutional design features. Thank you very much. Um, I think we, we might have a minute or two for a question from the audience. I have a question for David. I was impressed that uh, SEMIS has an economic impact of more than $1 billion. The numbers are in the, in the hundred of, hundreds of millions of dollars. And the benefit, the main benefit, is there are three types of benefit. Agricultural benefit, about 300 million. Uh, urban benefit, which is about 400 billion, uh, a million. And another uh, 200 million from others. What can DWR do to make SEMIS even better? Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. I think that SEMIS can be better. My feeling is that SEMIS is a, an incredible success story. I studied SEMIS several times, and some of our work actually continue to keep it uh, going. I think it can be better, for example, if you, uh, if you combine CMS uh, with a uh, mapping of soil, if you combine CMS and you provide more detailed uh, analysis, how you manage the uh, uh, irrigation scheduling. I think that w we have good information about water. Uh, it, it, it has to be more accurate, it has to be more, more detailed, and it has to be linked more, uh, more to soil. I think that if you look some of the results of this project and you link them to CMS, it would be great. Another thing that you can do, CMS, that relate to climate change, is have something like edit towers, so you can really improve the, uh, the measurement of evaporation. So to some extent, CMS, instead of uh, 
giving you the ET based on calculation. You can, you can have, uh, look at ET and other things using Eddy Tower and see, for example, what is really uh, uh, happening in the field. So altogether, I think developing very rigorous measurement of really what ab about the linkage between uh, agricultural irrigation and practices and emission of greenhouse gases and water that can use something like CMS that can be extensified would be extremely important for California agriculture. Great, please join me in thanking all the speakers.